Hello, everyone. Let me start by telling you a short story. I was born in Amman, Jordan. And one day in school, I was 10 years old at the time. At lunchtime, the library was supposed to be locked. But I turned the knob, and indeed it was not locked. I went in, and what I saw changed my whole life. I saw molecular drawings, and later I learned they were molecules. And it was these molecules that I fell in love with. And I kept my passion in studying and paying attention to these molecules. Very little did I know that one day, well, very little did I know that I will spend my whole life studying molecules, but that one day we would invent the largest class of materials and indeed a new kind of chemistry that is poised to solve the climate problem. So today, I want to share with you my scientific journey. And the new chemistry is called reticular chemistry. Reticular is a Latin word that means net or net-like. So these are networks. And I want to tell you how reticular chemistry is going to solve the climate problem. But first, some bad news. Our planet is crying for help. And there is evidence of that everywhere. The coral reef in Australia, off the coast of Australia, half of it is dead or bleached. It would take a hundred years for it to reverse because the water is warming. And look at this plot. This plot in the purple shows the number of events every year that are more intense than they've ever been. Weather events. Okay, I don't think any of us is a stranger to the fact that we are experiencing more intense weather, whether it's uh, ocean heat waves or land heat waves or wildfires. The result of this is that climate is no longer a distant problem. It affects us directly in our lives, in our homes. And around the world, it affects people's livelihoods, especially in the production of food. Here's another one that's especially disturbing to me. Malibu is one of the most beautiful places in America. And I didn't live very far from here, but it's burned. Okay? If you look at California in 2022, 4.3 million acres burned. Okay? Much more, multiple, the general average. This, this one worries me a great deal, having lived in Arizona as an independent, in my first um, independent position. The Hoover Dam is the largest dam in North America. And you can see every, since 1983, the level of water in the Hoover Dam has been reduced to a dangerously low level. Okay, the Hoover Dam supplies 16 million peoples with water. Where are, we, where are they going to get the water? Here's another concern, another evidence of we have a water crisis, not just a water stress, but one third of the world is experiencing a water crisis. And the UN projects that in the year 2040, six, five to six billion people would experience water stress for at least three months out of the year. Does it worry you? Yes. Especially the young people are demanding change. Okay? And so, The good news, okay, I'm not here to depress you, but I want, I want to show that, in fact, evidence of 
the problems that we are facing on our planet are real. But I'm here to share with you the solution. Solution comes from knowing exactly the cause and doing something about it. And the cause are these two small molecules. Some of the smallest molecules known to us. Okay, carbon dioxide. We are emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere more than ever before. This is causing climate change. The water crisis, perhaps we can fix it if we can take water out of the air. Okay, the difficulty in solving these problems, the climate problem, the water problem, is that to separate CO2 from air or from the flue gas of power plants, you have to take it out of a mixture of other substances. Okay, in the air we have nitrogen, oxygen, water, and other molecules not too dissimilar in size to CO2. So how are we going to pluck out just CO2 out of the air or pluck out just that water molecule out of the air? That's the difficulty. Okay, these difficulties, like many others, can be solved using the periodic table. Okay, and what we have done is we've taken molecules and stitched them together to make new materials. Okay, let me show you an example. We take common building units, okay, components of common materials, organic and inorganic, and here I'm showing plastics, components of plastics, components of sunscreen, combining them to make a whole new class of materials, metal organic frameworks, or MOFs. Here's the chemical structures. Okay, the organic structure acts as a strut, and the inorganic acts as a joint to make what is called a MOF. The blue is a metal oxide unit, and the wire-looking thing is the organic. And the yellow ball indicates a space within which you can trap carbon dioxide or water. The real development here is that not only can we make these, but we can actually modifying them, modify them on the atomic and molecular level. And we have made, we and others, since we discovered them in the mid-1990s, have made hundreds of thousands of them because we developed the chemistry that led to them. So, here's an example. Let me... Uh, here's an example of what they look like. They're microcrystalline, small little crystals, just like little diamonds. And now we're going to zoom in into one of these crystals that are, you can see them with your eye, but then you zoom in on the molecular level. And you can see they look like frames. They're really frameworks that are very open. And the idea is to take gases that fill very large space and compact them into the pores of the material. Because the gas molecules attach themselves to the interior of the pores, better than attaching themselves to each other without the pores, we can compact gases in the, in the pores of these materials. Let me show you. If your eye can see a moth, it will see this picture that is rotating on the screen. Everything you're looking at is an adsorptive site. The gray atoms as well as the pink atoms are all adsorptive sites. That means they are sites that can be tailored to extract CO2 from air or extract water from air or any other substance, depending on how you modify the pores. This material, one gram of this material, which is no bigger than this circle, okay, one gram covers an entire football field in terms of the space that it encompasses. 
One gram has a surface area of 6,400 meters square. Okay? Your apartment is probably 100 meters square. This material in one gram has 6,400 meters square. So the space that is encompassed within that gram can cover an entire football field. Okay? And that's the power of reticular chemistry. So, let's see what they do. So, after many years of research, we have developed MOFs, this one rotating on the screen, and if you look inside the pores, you can see tiny groups that have a green head. These are what we call primary amines. Okay, these are the molecules that we have programmed into the pores to seek out CO2 from air and only CO2. Or CO2 from flue gas and power plant and only CO2. And look at the results. Okay, the results are here. In the air, we have 400 ppm. When air is passed through this material, CO2 is depleted, less than 2 ppm, almost nothing. So the MOF works. Okay, the scientific challenge of extracting CO2 from air is solved. Okay, the rest is engineering and uh, commercialization. Let me show you another result. This is flue gas from power plants, 15% CO2. Under real conditions, the material reduces this CO2 down to less than 2%. The MOF works. There is hope. Okay? This is made possible because we are able to design every component in this structure. This is a kind of chemistry that we have never experienced prior to the development of reticular chemistry. And so in terms of CO2 capture from air and CO2 capture from flue gas, we are very close to optimizing a material. This is the first generation, but we have a second generation that we can optimize and commercialize. Already, CO2 capture from cement plants, okay, from cement plants, that's almost one third of the CO2 emitted from industry is emitted from cement plant. Already that's commercialized using MOFs. Okay, and that's already um, MOFs are being scaled up to multi-ton quantities by BASF to capture CO2 from cement. So already we can see hope that in fact we can remove CO2 and reverse climate change. Now I want to move to water and I'm going to tell you another Short story, very quickly. When I was a kid in Jordan, my job was to make sure that when the water comes, the water came to our house from the city once every two weeks for five hours. So my job was to make sure that I'm awake early enough to turn the faucet on and fill as many containers as possible within those five hours. That's the water that my family had for the entire two weeks until the water comes in again. If you used it up, then you have to find other sources of water. So I am very much... Uh, I can feel, I have felt, what it's like to live in an arid region of the world. So the idea is this. The red regions in this map have low humidity in the air. They're arid regions. They are water stressed. The blue regions, they are humid and they have water. But in many places, that water is not clean. So if I could design a material that is, extracts water from the red regions of the world at low humidity, that moth 
that material will also work everywhere in the world. So our vision is, could we harvest water from air anywhere in the world at any time of the year? Okay? And before you tell me that we're going to dry the air, in fact, there's so much water in the air. There's almost 13,000 cubic kilometers of water in the air at any one time. If I was to give each human being on Earth 50 liters of water a day, I would have only used less than 1%, much less than 1% of the water that is in the air. So there's plenty of water in the air. We just need to be able to capture it and harness it to make it uh, usable at drinking water. So what's the difficulty in harvesting water from air? This is a psychrometric chart. It's a plot of how much water is in the air versus temperature. And you can see the humidity lines, 10%, 20%, all the way to 100%. At 100%, you have liquid water. OK? So imagine that I'm in a Mediterranean city, let's say in south of Spain, Granada. OK? In Granada, let's say I'm at A, 30 degrees Celsius and 20% humidity. For me to get the water out of that air, I need to cool it down to B, which is 4 degrees Celsius. That's refrigeration. That is not economical. Now imagine that I put at A a moth that's programmed to extract the water from air and stuff it into its pores. And then take that water out by heating and condense it. Then I would have turned desert air into tropical air. Okay? That's the idea that we have been working on. How does water enter the moth? Okay, this movie is showing it. This is one pore in the moth, and we're slicing it in half so that you can see the water shown in red here, that it goes into the hydrophilic regions first, fills the hydrophilic regions, and then bridges across with more water across the hydrophobic regions. And so the interior of the moth, if I was a water molecule floating inside the pore of the moth, I am experiencing hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic regions. And this hydrophilic, the attraction and repulsion, allows you to remove the water under mild conditions so that you're not putting in a lot of energy into the system. So here's a first generation device that we wanted to test in the desert. OK, we did all the homework in the laboratory the discovery, all the studies, and we made one kilogram of moth, put it in this small box. We put the small box in a larger box. At night, we let the air in. The air goes through the moth. The moth is programmed to extract the water out. And during the day, you close the larger box, and the interior heats up in the sunlight. Water comes out, condenses, and you can collect water. OK, so my students took this to Arizona and harvested water from Arizona desert. Action. Cheers. Nice. The water that we harvested is ultra pure. There is the cleanest water you can ever find. This is a, what you saw there is a prototype that's electrified. The first prototype, the box within a box, harvested water from air with no energy input aside from sunlight. The second device with the Bach music, 
can harvest five liters of water per day from 200 grams of moth. 200 grams of moth produce five liters of water in a device no larger than your microwave oven. Clean water. You are in control of your water. Okay? You are water independent. Okay? And the moth stays in the device for over five years. You don't have to change it. You don't have to replenish it. And at the end of the moth journey, you can disassemble it into its original components and reassemble it in water. Okay? With a zero discharge process. Now, I want to show you that based on those results, we can then, upon deployment of these devices in the desert, this is, this is what we would get. Okay? You can see here, this is the driest desert in the world. That moth can harvest in the driest time of the year in August about seven liters of water per kilogram of moth per day. Okay, imagine other places. This is the Mojave Desert, the driest desert in North America. This is Lanzhou in China, Kabul, Riyadh. In Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, you can harvest almost 35 liters of water per kilogram of moth per day. And the moth keeps working for over five years. Okay? And you can see that, in fact, you can have it in any part of the world, harvesting water at any time of the year. Now, let me tell you how powerful chemistry is. We've got a moth that's working very well, but we want to increase the uptake. Okay, we want to serve more people water. And the chemistry that we developed, we can, sorry, we can go from this type of linker to this type of linker by simply adding, it's almost in a surgical way, adding two carbon atoms. By adding these two carbon atoms, the moth takes up 50% more water because it has a little bit larger pores. Without changing all the great things about the moth, the adsorptive size that I've been talking about, and the, the less energy that is needed to remove the water. Okay, what does that mean? It means that a moth taking water out of the air, if I have one ton of moth with no energy input aside from ambient sunlight, I can harvest 2,250 2, liters of water every day for over five years with, without changing the moth. If I electrify this device, the one ton of moth can serve 25,000 liters of water per day. Now we're talking about real progress, where people who live in arid regions of the world or live in parts of the world that are watered, but the water is not clean. Now we can begin to see the hope. So, but that's not all. Once you know how to design materials on the atomic and molecular level, with precision, the possibilities of the things that you can solve are endless. So MOFs are being investigated in over 100 countries around the world and investigating all kinds of applications, including biomedical applications, clean energy, clean water, and clean air, plus many other applications. Well, so that's my story. And I got started by falling in love with molecules on a very young age. So don't hesitate to fall in love with something in school, okay? Don't hesitate to have to be interested in things without having to necessarily be ambitious about solving problems. Just be passionate. And when you're passionate and you solve intellectual problems, then you create things that have many different applications. That's my story. 
Thank you very much.